Hey everyone, Mrs. Bosega here, and today we're working on the Unit 11 Review Packet. All right, so remember, I would like you to try all the problems first, then check your answer against the answer key, and finally, come to this video and only watch the parts that you're stuck on. Let's get started. The first two pages are just the objectives, and these are the things that you should be able to do. So maybe think of these as checklists. Can you describe how a prism spreads light of different colors and how this leads to dispersion? If you feel you can do this, put a little check next to it. And then as you go through, you'll be able to highlight which things you're stuck on and which things, you know, you're probably pretty good at not reviewing. So let's start with the multiple choice. All of the following are images formed by converging lenses, except, ooh, real, upright, and larger. That's because a converging lens can make all sorts of images. You'll see in this one, it makes a virtual upright larger. You'll see in the one below it, it makes a uh, real smaller inverted, but you can never have real and upright together. Real and inverted always occurs together. Virtual and upright always occurs together but you can't have real and upright. A concave lens causes parallel rays to diverge. This is the type of lens that when a ray goes through the center, they diverge away from a certain focal point. This focal length is considered negative because it's diverging away from it. So diverging away from a focal point. On the other hand, convex lenses cause convergence. That means if you had parallel rays of light, then they would go towards a common focal point. This has a positive focal length because it literally converges the light here, as opposed to concave with its negative focal length where it diverges. Now, the focal length and radius of curvature are related to each other because two focal lengths make one radius. I'm not a huge fan of this wording here because the center of curvature is a point, but the radius of curvature is a length. The radius of curvature is twice as big as the focal length. So I would choose answer, mm, ooh, I would choose answer D. The radius of curvature is two times the focal length. And that's why in this picture below it, the center of curvature would be here. And to be clear, the radius of curvature is this distance, but the center of curvature is a point. So a center of curvature does not have a distance associated. That's why I went and switched all those words. Now for number five, you could memorize this you could memorize that when an object is close to the lens, you get a virtual upright larger image, but I'm not a memorizing person. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna draw my ray diagram. Starting from the top of the candle, I'm gonna draw a parallel ray. It goes parallel to the principal axis until it reaches the optical axis, this. That. So it goes parallel in. Then, because this is a converging lens, my ray converges at the focal point, okay? But in order to make an image, I need to use at least three, or sorry, at least two of three rays. So starting from the top of the candle again, I'm gonna go straight through the vertex. And this isn't like randomly down, this has to go through this vertex point. Now my eye would see these two rays as diverging and assume they came from a common location. Extrapolating those rays backwards, my brain would think that the light came from back here. That the top of the candle is like here which would put the bottom of the candle on the principal axis. The image of the candle is very big. The object is smaller. 
So I would call this a virtual upright larger image and that chooses this one. This M greater than one means larger. Keeping with the same logic, I wouldn't memorize number six. I would draw these out. So let's say that I wanna draw my principal rays. I still know that I need to have one ray that shows that this is a converging lens. Ray one goes parallel to the principal axis and at the optical axis, switches directions and it goes down towards the focal point. Ray three starts at the top of the object and goes through the vertex. Some classes didn't do a second ray and we called, we just called this one ray two. I don't super care what you call the rays as long as you know how to draw them. So this ray starts at the top of the object, goes through the vertex and travels in a straight line. If your class did do the second ray, then it looks something like this. It goes towards the focal point and at the, what do we call it? At the optical axis, changes direction to go parallel out. It's the opposite of ray one. It forms not quite a parallelogram. See how they're not parallel here? Not quite a parallelogram. So that the flame of this candle is here. The feet, the base of this candle is on the principal axis. And compared to the original candle, this one is smaller. But let's say you got to this point and you're like, I really can't tell. Dude, you can just measure it. <laughs> the original candle is about two centimeters tall, just a little bit short of it. So I'm gonna rate HO is 1.8 centimeters. HI, the height of the image, is only 1.2 centimeters. So comparatively, the image is smaller than the object, so I would choose smaller. This is a real image because the rays literally intersect. This is inverted because the flame of the candle is now below the principal axis, and it's m less than 1 because the image is smaller than the object. Now, for number 7, this is asking you to use the memorize method. With the memorize method, you should know that if the object is far from the lens, and I'll draw this out, no worries. If the object is far from the lens, and I'll do this with colors, let's say it's in the purple region. Let's say my object is anywhere in this purple region. Then it makes a real, inverted, and small image. If you get a little closer, this makes a real, inverted, larger image. If you get even closer than that, the image switches over to be virtual and larger and upright because all virtual images are upright. So if you're a memorizing person, you can see that it goes from small to large, large. You can see it goes real, real, virtual. And real always goes with inverted, virtual always goes with upright. That is only true for convex lenses because those cause convergence. Hey, hey concave lens lenses always cause the same type of image, so no worries, we'll practice those later. But on this front, it means that at a distance of 1.5, if you put an object right here, it would make a real inverted larger image, which if you wanted to, you could still try by drawing. You could like draw an object right here and then draw the rays out to test this if you wanted. But this question is specifically asking you to memorize this pattern, that it's small images when you're far, small and real, then larger images if you're closer, and finally, virtual large images when you're closest. For number eight, 
The crystalline lens in the human eye is convex, and therefore the image on the retina is inverted. The lens inside the human eye looks just like that. That's convex. It bends outwards on both sides, so it is a converging lens. That makes a real image on the back of the retina, which then stimulates the photoreceptors, sends a signal up to your brain through the optic nerve. <laughs> You're right. For number nine, which of the following is not an additive primary color of light is yellow. Red, green, and blue go along with the cones that exist in the human eye. There is no specific cone looking for yellow light. Yellow is actually a subtractive primary color. For number 10, dispersion is caused because light with a high frequency refracts more than a light with low frequency. I actually don't need you to understand this pattern, the high-low frequency pattern, so don't worry too much about this. But what I'm looking for you to know for number 10 is that dispersion has to do with refraction. The answer happens to be A, by the way. But dispersion happens to do with refraction so that when light goes through a prism, for instance, let's say this is white light going in, blue has the higher frequency and bends farther from its original path. Sorry, I'm drawing this a little funky. Red goes closer to its original path because its frequency is lower and bends less. This pattern shows that blue bends more than red. So blue bends more. That's why violet is on the inside of a rainbow is that the violet light, when passed through a prism, simply bends at a larger angle than any other color. Red is on the outside of a rainbow because having the lower frequency bends less from its original path. So for dispersion, you need two things. You need refraction and color separation. That could look like a full rainbow like this case right here. But it might also just look like distorted colors, like on the edges of a magnifying glass or at the edges of, a, of lenses. For number 11, we have a nearsighted person and a nearsighted person has eyes that converge too much. Like, thanks for the enthusiasm, but you've bent the light so much that now the image isn't forming on the retina. To fix that, I need the light to be slightly diverged before it gets to my eye. Of course, the ray that goes straight through continues to go straight through. Things that hit straight on don't get refracted. But light that goes through this upper part is gonna slightly diverge, right? And when it slightly diverges, the eye will still converge it back. Converging um, sorry, when it over converges the light, you fix it by slightly diverging it. Number 12, color vision. Your eye sees yellow when it sees a combination of some red and some green photons. So think the color yellow is like right in here. And when you see the color yellow, that activates your green cones and your red cones and sends a signal to your brain that says red green. Your brain then looks at this color and thinks to itself yellow. Your eye can see yellow photons, real actual yellow light with a wavelength between 533 or 535 and 575 nanometers. Your eye can see real yellow light because the yellow light stimulates red and green cones and sends that up to your brain, which then makes the perception of yellow. So all a television or cell phone screen has to do to make the additive color process work is put some red and some green and some blue in different combinations to make millions of colors of light. 
think to yourself, all right, I could do 1% blue with 1% red and 1% green. And that color would be different than 1% blue and 1% red and 2% green. A cell phone or television or other digital screen uses discrete colors, red, green, and blue, to trick your brain into thinking it's seeing millions of colors instead of just three. Now, for 14 through 16, I would strongly suggest that your justification include a picture. I'm going to show you both ways, um, or I'll show you three different ways with each one, but I would strongly suggest use a picture. And the reason I suggest that is, let's say I have yellow sunglasses. Um, number 14 assumes white light. I know it doesn't say so. Let's say I have white light to start. That means there's some red, some green, and some blue. And then it hits a magenta colored ball. Magenta subtracts green light. Magenta only lets red and blue pass because it is made of red and blue. So red gets reflected, blue gets reflected. Magenta absorbs the colors it's not made of. It's not made of green, so magenta subtracts green. Finally, I have my yellow sunglasses, which I know you can't see, so I'm gonna put a little sunglasses filter around them. Yellow only lets through the colors it is made of, so it lets through red. It doesn't let through blue because yellow is made of red and green. It is not made of blue, so it absorbs the blue. So green got subtracted, blue got subtracted. I suggest drawing a picture because this helps to emphasize that the color of light you start with determines the color of light that's left over. So let's say I started with a source that was white. It had some red, some green, and some blue. The magenta object subtracted the uh, green. The yellow filter subtracted the blue. And now there's only red left. So you could write this out with letters. You could draw a picture about it, which I think is the best way. Let's see what else you could do. So number 15, we're going to draw a picture again, then I'm going to show you another way to deal with this. So I don't have cyan in front of me. Let's just put some green and blue on a thing. Um, it's a cyan ball. Uh, it's not very cyan, but we'll live. <laughs> it's a cyan ball and we have green sunglasses. If it doesn't tell you what color it is, assume it's white light. So I have a white source of light. That's made up of red, green, and blue. At the cyan ball, cyan only lets through the colors that it's made of. So cyan lets blue pass and lets green pass. Cyan doesn't let through red because cyan is opposite red on the color spectrum. So cyan absorbs the red light. There's no red that makes it past the first barrier. And now my cyan light hits the green filter. Green only lets through the colors it's made of. Green lets through green, no problem. And it's like, go right ahead, my buddy. But it doesn't let through blue. So my apparent color is green. So the other way you could justify your answer, you could draw. You could make a mathematical looking equation here. You could also write. You could turn on typing and say something like the white light, white source, is made of red, green, and blue. The cyan ball absorbs red, subtracting it from the mix. 
So now there is no red light. The green filter absorbs blue. So only green remains. So you could draw about it. You could make a mathematical model about it. You could write about it. I like the drawing, so we're gonna keep going with drawing. Let's do number 16. This time it tells you the light. It is a cyan light and a yellow shirt. There is no filter, so I'm just gonna draw my eyeball right here. The cyan light is made of a combo of green light and blue light. And it gets to the yellow shirt. Yellow lets green through because it's made of green. But yellow absorbs blue because it's opposite on the color spectrum. Yellow and blue being opposite means that yellow absorbs blue light. No blue makes it out of this barrier to go into your eyes. So green light remains. Cool. Now, if you are in my 5480 class, you can skip ahead. You don't need to do problems 17, 18, and 19 if you're in 5480. But if you're in 5470, buckle up, we're gonna do some math. All right, so for the lens computations, we're gonna use SI, SO, HI, HO, M, and F to calculate a bunch of things. From our value of M, we'll be able to figure out the classification of the image. So let's start off with, we know the focal length was negative 15. The distance of object to lens, that's SO, is 10 centimeters. So to calculate the distance of image to lens, that's SI. And there's only one equation that makes sense here. This relates the focal length, SI and SO, and it's called the lens maker's equation. You get one point for writing the equation, one point for the correct substitution. So equation, substitution, let's solve this out. Now, what I don't want you to do is 15 minus 10. What you're actually doing is you're using the inverse function. So one over 15, inver uh, negative, minus one over 10, equals one over SI. You need to use the inverse function because this is not 15 and 10, it's 1 15th and 1 10th. So what I'm gonna do is 15, sorry, negative 15 inverse, minus 10 inverse. This whole term on the left then is negative 0 0.16. To solve for SI, I'm going to switch SI and this number. To solve for SI, I need it by itself in the numerator. And so what I'm doing is called cross multiplying. I'm switching the numerator and denominator that are diagonal from each other. That is a legit thing, you can do that. So SI is equal to one divided by the number we just got. And that's equal to negative six. Now, before I go do magnification, I already know that this means this is a virtual image. Wherever SI is negative, that means virtual. A virtual image also means upright, so that's cool. But I don't know large or small or same size, so let's go deal with that in a second. Let's use one of the equations for M. There are two choices. And remember, you could always write down both and cross one out that doesn't make sense. Like, I listed my knowns and unknowns, and I don't know anything about the H's. So, not that. Has to be this. So now I'm going to go substitute. I got my point for my equation. Point for substitute. And it's negative SI. Negative, negative, cancels. 
So negative six over 15, with the negative canceling, gives me 0.4. Since this number is less than one, this is a smaller image. So this positive sign that's implied here, because negative times negative is positive, means that this is upright. Upright automatically means virtual, so hey, nice to see that these agree. And because 0.4 is less than one, think of this as saying like, all right, the image is 40% of the size of the original. So for justify my answer, maybe I say something like, um, M is positive, therefore virtual and upright. M is less than one, so it's a smaller. Now, I also know off the top of my head that this is correct, or at least reasonable, because diverging lens, concave lenses, always make virtual, upright, smaller images. Think like your fisheye lens always makes this type of image. All right, let's do more math about it. 17, 18, and 19 are just having you practice the math. So an object is placed 20 centimeters away, so that's SO is 20, from a thin converging lens that's convex with a positive focal length along the axis of a lens. If a real image forms, so that's SI is positive, at a distance of 30 centimeters, solve for F. So hey, I'm gonna solve the same equation from before, the lens maker's equation, but solve it for F this time. Because it's a real image, that's positive 30. So that's one over 20 plus one over 30. And just for funsies, instead of using the inverses, uh, let's do least common denominator. Least common denominator of 20 and 30 is 60. This is 3 sixtieths plus 2 sixtieths or 5 sixtieths. So 1 over F equals 5 over 60. I'm going to cross multiply this out. So I'm going to cross multiply and switch 5 and F and 1 and 60. So this says 60 and 1, they've switched places. 5 and F are switching places. So that's pretty sweet. F is equal to 60 over 5. Oh, I can totally do this. F is positive 12 centimeters. And that makes sense because I expected a positive number. Because this is converging, I expect a positive focal length. If I got a negative at the end here, I would be concerned. So let's calculate magnification. Uh, just like before, we don't have the H values, so let's just deal with the negative SI over SO. We know SI was 30, but SI was 30 with this negative sign up front. SO was 20. 30 over 20 is 1.5. This negative sign means it is inverted. Inverted images are always real. 1.5 means larger. And hey, if you are checking, you could use like this memorizing thing to check. If I have an object that's within this range, it makes a real inverted larger image. And hey, we got a real inverted larger image. What about that? So whichever way you choose to do it, it should be self, um, not self-sufficient, um, self-contained. It should agree with itself. So let's do one more math before we get back to ray diagrams. You want to create an upright image that is magnified by a factor of three. So what that text is saying, read it super carefully, Upright image means M is positive. Magnified by a factor of three means it's positive three. The type of lens that can form this image is convex 
or converging. It's a magnifying glass, guys. <laughs> a magnifying glass makes a larger virtual upright image. And now we go on. You determine that you need to place the photograph 10 centimeters from the lens. So that's SO equals 10. And you get the image that's positive three times the size. Calculate the distance the image will appear from the lens. That's calculate SI. And solve for SI. The equation that has both S's and M in it is M equals negative SI over SO. Substituting to solve, this is 3 equals negative SI over 10. Multiplying the 10 to the other side, because think like, okay, if I multiply by a 10 on the left and a 10 on the right, these 10s cancel. That leaves 30 equals negative SI, so that SI equals negative 30. This makes sense to me because if SI is negative, this means virtual. And virtual images are always upright which is good because I want a magnifying glass that makes a, oh, look at that, upright image. So calculate the focal length. Cool, I expect a positive focal length because it is this shape. Using our lens makers equation for one last time on here. The last time before you go take this on your own for your test. I'm gonna do one over 10 plus one over negative 30. Keep that negative sign there, friends. And let's solve for one over F. We'll do the inverse method this time. I'm calculating all this business in my calculator. So that's one tenth minus one thirtieth. That's the whole term in parentheses. So that says one over F equals 0 0.06 repeating. I'm going to switch my numerator and denominator. We'll cross multiply. This says f is equal to 1 over this number. So that putting this into your calculator, inverse button is right there if you need it, is positive 15. I expect this to be positive because if this is converging, then that needs to be a positive focal length. It's all coming together. All right, so let's practice a few more drawings then. So I can use the math methods to classify images based on the value of M being positive or negative or large or small. When we get to light, like number 20, right? let's draw the rays out. Remember, no matter what, one of the rays starts from the top of the object and goes straight through the vertex. If you want, you could do all of those in a row. Do like <laughs> all the rays that go through the vertex. Connect the top of the object through the vertex, keep going. The next ray starts from the top of the object and either converges or diverges when it reaches the optical axis. So parallel in. And this is a diverging shape lens. So I'm gonna draw it not randomly up, but diverging away from this focal point. Now, your brain's looking at these rays and it's like, those don't intersect. And you're right, they don't intersect in real life. This is going to make a virtual image. So, extrapolate this ray backward. Your brain thinks this ray came from right here. It sees this object as having its point here. It's base on the principal axis. So this is an upright, smaller, virtual image. Yes, so they used to call these erect images. We now switch to upright so that we don't have to giggle so much. But you can giggle anyways, whatever. It's an, it is an upright image and smaller. All right, so let's do a few more. So again, start with the top of your object, go straight through the vertex. If you want, you can do all of these at the same time. 
top of the object through the vertex, keep going. Then your next ray either converges or diverges depending on the shape of your lens. So this one would go parallel in and converge through the focal point. This one would go parallel in and converge through the focal point. And now your brain sees this object. On this one, it thinks this object must be back here. So I'm gonna draw my image that is virtual, upright, larger than the original. We call this upright now. On this one, the image is now inverted. And these in theory should be exactly the same size. Let's just double check. If I go from the top of the object, that's one centimeter, that's one centimeter, they should be the same size, but if you've got something slightly different, no worries. So this is real, real is always inverted. So real is always inverted because that's where the rays actually cross. Upright is always virtual because this is when the rays do not cross. Which brings us to the eye. The eye. Now, notice that not all the parts of the eye will get used. Um, let's start with the outside of the eye. Let's find the cornea. The cornea is number eight. It's this bump that's right here. The cornea has to focus the light entering the eye. That's one of its functions. But the cornea also protects the eye. So the cornea does more than one thing. Cool. The ciliary muscles. These are the muscles that pull on that crystalline lens. The ciliary muscles are number six. They change the shape of the lens to vary the focal length. The iris is this colorful little muscle right here. So I'm gonna draw it as colorful. So that's kind of fun. That looks like number 10 to me. The iris is a colorful muscle that pulls this pupil open and closed to let in light. So number 10 was the iris and that is the muscle, let's see if we can find it, that controls the amount of light entering the eye. The pupil is the hole itself that the iris opens and closes. So the pupil is number nine. The lens or crystalline lens is number seven. It's this convex lens right here that's gonna converge the light on the back of the eye. So both the cornea and the crystalline lens focus light. Your brain can control the crystalline lens by flexing or relaxing the ciliary muscles, but the cornea is permanently shaped that way, unless you get eye surgery. The optic nerve is number one. It carries this information from the back of the retina up into the brain. That leaves the retina. Um, the retina, I'm gonna call number four. This whole section, and I, I'm calling it number four because do you see how like it's all the way up here, right? And it's going through like the whole back of the eyeball. I'm gonna call that number four, but if you said it was three or two or five, I could see just because there was extra numbers here. So carries optical information to the brain is the optic nerve. and the photoreceptive rods and cones are the retina. So let's recap light, light going through the eye here. As light goes through the cornea, it bends. It passes through the pupil with the iris opening and closing to let in some light. It's focused through the crystalline lens, which is controlled by the ciliary muscles. That forms a real inverted smaller image on the back of the eyeball. So I'm gonna draw an example here. Let's say you're looking at a tree. Look at that art. 
tree. I know this is a smaller image because the tree might be very, very big. And the image it forms on the back of my eyeball is probably like one or two centimeters tall tops. Once it's on the retina, it's picked up by your rods and cones. Rods and cones have some similarities and differences. Things they have in common, they are cells that are photodetectors. They collect light. They are on your retina. Cool. Maybe we say we can say they're cells. That's the things they have in common. Rods are more numerous. There's many of them. About 130 million per eyeball. They are evenly spread on the retina. As a result, because they're all over the retina, you can use this for peripheral vision. Plus, because you have so many of them, you can have this work in dim light. It needs only a little bit of light in order to work. Rods are the primary parts of the, or the primary photo detectors you use in dim light. Rods can use peripheral vision and they're also very good at detecting movement. So that's kind of nice because when you see a predator or prey, you can react quickly because of your rods. Cones, on the other hand, there are not very many of them. They are only spread in the center of your retina. It's a special spot called the fovea. It's like right there. They're only in the center of your retina. So they're good for fine detail. They're good for color. They come with our red, green, and blue. Slightly different shapes give slightly different color sensitivities. Right? But this needs bright light. That's because there's so few of them, you need bright light in order for them to work. That's why you can't see color in the dark or find detail in the dark, is because your cones need more light in order to work. This center of the eye thing explains why like you can't read a paper in your peripheral vision. It needs to be right in front of your eyes in order for it to work. Now that you're done, go back and check against this list. Have you been able to do all the things? Could you classify images could you draw all the images? Notice we practiced like six times on these. No, we practiced one, two, three, five times on these. So that's gonna be pretty important if we practice that five times. Draw or identify the paths of parallel rays of light. That would be the whole like, does it converge? Or diverge? That's what that's getting at. For dispersion, that's the whole like dispersion is when light refracts and causes spreading of different colors. If you are in 5480, you don't need to do any of the lens calculations except for this one, which we'll practice in class. All the other ones you can skip. If you're 5470, be able to do all those things. And everyone again. You should know the parts of the eye, where they are, what they do, how to adjust the amount of light with the iris and pupil, how to adjust the focus with ciliary muscles and the crystalline lens, and identify what type of eye, or sorry, what type of lens you need if your light is over-converged or under-converged. You should be able to do all the additive and subtractive colors. So like, what does green plus blue look like to that, together? What does a cyan ball look like under magenta light?
All right, everyone. So that is it. Best of luck on your last test of the year. Bye.